we weren't living our best lives. And, and um, so we started to explore. But the most important part of that exploration was actually diving into myself and, and realizing that, um, that I actually wasn't really living in my body. And, and I wasn't doing the things that I actually wanted. I had this belief system that all the things that I was doing that were causing me um, to work too hard or all those things were actually really destroying my nervous system and maybe is the reason that I went into very, very early menopause. And so since then, I've been really trying to bring all the stress, bring all the cortisol out of my my body, like listening to you has helped me to recognize how very important that is. But but realizing that uh, that I was operating at a high level of stress all the time and that I seem to really like that. My nervous system seemed to crave it um, and and recognizing that maybe there was something I needed to work on there. So just digging up all the things that uh, were causing me to subconsciously choose things that were causing me more frustration and pain so that I could then be able to say, oh, wait, I actually don't need to engage in that argument. It means nothing. Or, uh, or I really do just want to be home or I want to be cared for by my husband. I want rather than. than or you, or you want to care for your husband. Oh, exa- both of those things are true. Right. We'll exactly. Talk about that. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. But realizing that, you know, a lot of my beliefs have come from ex- outside of me and and starting to listen to what I really wanted and as opposed to listening to everything I learned in programming and the sitcoms and and movies that that give you this false idea of what reality is um, in a relationship was really important for me to recognize. One of the things that was brought to my attention several years ago was this concept of, of childhood wounding and, and mm-hmm. how we, we get wounded, whether it's through real trauma or perceived mm-hmm. trauma or emotional trauma. And if it's not addressed and, and dealt with in a proper way, which is what parents are supposed to do, uh, mm-hmm. they often don't because they're still manifesting their childhood wounding in adult life. We, we set these patterns of behavior up that they might be different on the surface, but it's playing out that same messaging. And we get accustomed to that where we don't really know any different. And so we just go through life recreating uh, different, different like on the surface scenarios as we transition through life and still getting that same message that uh, Wayne's world, we are, we are not worthy. <laughs> <laughs> message for all of us really like the reality is if we are uh, not feeling connected to ourselves and our tribe then uh, that we may not feel worthy but it's very very important for us because we're such a social herd animal we need to be a part of that we need to be worthy in order to feel safe and and so with all this messaging that comes from uh, from other places even makeup ads and all of those things that constantly tell us that our body isn't good enough or what we do isn't enough if we're not um, working 80 hours a week and have three children and have lots of sex with our husbands and and be happy and smiling about that then we're a failure as a woman um, or a man you know and so it it really it's it's an important thing to start to recognize like what is the root of of these it, these decisions that we make you know i i remember listening to someone speak about free will and do we really have free will based on all of our life experiences, we make decisions based on on all of those experiences. Um, So I think that as we start to recognize what our wounding is, like you said, then we can make more informed and better decisions for us. Yeah, and and, and the thing is because of this wounding, and I see this play out with people, especially especially in in the endurance market. I mean, one of my Mm -hmm. close friends, we, we talked a lot about this because of our own childhood stuff was very similar because of our cultural backgrounds. And like in endurance, we see this, this bifurcation. It's, it's, a, it's a spectrum, but there's this clear bifurcation of you have people in ultra endurance who are successful in every, truly successful in every vein of their life. And mm-hmm. so their endurance is just an extension of who they are. And then you have these people who like their whole life is wrapped up in like, I'm an ultra runner or I am an, Iron Man, or I ride centuries, and it's like, what are you running from? It was actually really humbling when I really realized that I found you through endurance running and recognizing that I wasn't, I wasn't running as effectively as I could. When especially when this beautiful little fairy of a woman passed me, like she was floating through the air, and I was just trying to get through this 50 um, and I realized I started to dive into myself and it was really humbling when I realized that I was actually running away from myself this entire time 
and um, and I had to look at a lot of things. It's really the most powerful thing, Peter, to take take control and to look at yourself because it took me a really long time because I try I was trying to control the world around me, and I was trying <laughs> to say you know, <laughs> in an effort to not look at my issues. But um, but once I started to realize, oh shit, I can actually really like if I look at this and I I realize that um, that if I just pause for a minute before I say something that might cause a fight or if I, if I just realize that I'm not trying to change someone else, I'm just, I have an unmet need and how can I meet that need myself instead of expecting it from other people um, and figuring out what those needs were was really the crucial part. It was really the thing that I needed to, to recognize is that when you feel, I believe, when you feel like you're not worthy, then you don't ask for things because if somebody says no, then it can be extremely devastating. And that is a strategy that uh, I know I certainly use and I know I'm not alone in that. And so once I started to, yeah, <laughs> once I started to realize that, um, that I, I could meet my own needs, but also that my husband, for instance, wanted to meet my needs. So if I just asked for what I wanted from him, then he would fall over backwards and forwards and in every way to meet that need. Because this is, and to me, this was the biggest lie ever told is that, yes, we need to meet our own needs, but also meeting, meeting each other's needs is part of fulfilling ourselves and, and fulfilling each other. And so when I started to realize polarity and that we had in our relationship, we had a reversed polarity that I had believed that I was supposed to be the ball buster and, and, um, and that he should be intuitive and just know everything about me and he should be able to read me. And that's absolute absurdity. Um, <laughs> Thank you, Dina. <laughs> just not how you guys work or how we work either. No, no, oh. no. They're, they're, like I say, in, in, there's a reason why in most mammal species, the males go off on their bachelor herds after the mating season. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah, probably one of the simplest little things that I learned in my life that that helped to change how I felt in my relationship was reading a little book called The Queen's Code. And it just showed me how the way that I spoke to my husband actually really emasculated him. And and it gave him it, like it took away his purpose. Like if I like if he came in, for instance, it's just a simple, fun little example. Like if he came into the kitchen and uh, I was jumping up on the counter because I'm five foot nothing to try and get something in a top cover. To, um, and he would say, can I get that for you? And if I just said, no, I can get it myself. That little act, it it is it, it kind of it cuts his balls off and it takes away his purpose. He's five nine or five ten and he can reach the shelf and he can absolutely get that for me and when he does and i just look him in the eyes and say thank you um, and i'm not stressing myself out trying to get the goddamn jar that <laughs> things work a little bit more smoothly but it takes a lot of reprogramming to realize that that is something that that can actually supercharge your life is if you just lean into what when I started to lean into what his strengths were and to ask him to take care of me and he would do the same and I would take care of him with joy like get to a point where he's done all kinds of things throughout the day that when he gets home I'll just say what can I get for you for dinner like those little things uh, those little things make both of us happy and and what a, what a concept what, what a concept, concept. what a concept yeah, yeah. And, mm -hmm. and unfortunately this is not the 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 narrative for lack of a better term and then i'm sure mm -hmm. i'm sure it probably would it you know i'll have you talk about your end of it as a woman but i'm sure it also triggered passive aggressive behavior in jack oh it was i i can't speak to that for certain but we definitely were were at each other yeah. and uh, and we were we were not meeting each other's needs and we were trying to feel our needs from each other passive aggressively both ways i'm sure absolutely yeah. and i'd rather not remember that but <laughs> no no but it, it, it's, it's 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 important to recognize it because yeah. there is so much passive aggressive behavior and, and it's and a lot of it is just unintentional it is and it's learned it's a learned behavior yeah. And it's we learn it from everywhere. And like I said, like I alluded to earlier, like it's we see it on the sitcoms, we see it in our movies, we see it everywhere. We even read about it in books a lot of the time. And it's it's programmed us to behave this way. And the profundity of recognizing that, holy cow, the everything that I've learned in the world 
is working against my physiology. And therefore, is that the reason that I, I had a, an extremely early menopause and, and everything in my life changed? And it, that was a really profound experience for me to realize that nearly everything that I had, had learned was maybe not as it seemed. And so it's been a powerful relearning and remembering of, of what it is that I want and, and need. Yeah, and, and so that creation of the sanctuary starts within. Yes, yes, yeah, coming into myself and, and recognizing what my wants were. I had shut myself down so effectively, I didn't even know what I wanted. And, and sometimes when I actually and, and, and up, let me let me let me just stop you there. Mm -hmm. Hold that thought, because yeah. once you get to that point, you're very susceptible to messaging. Yeah. Yeah, it's true. Yeah. Um, and hopefully I found the messaging. I believe I found the messaging that I was open to that is actually good for me and my nervous system and my body and my family. And and I, I feel like it is. And the more that I speak to you, the more that I learn from other mentors, the more that I spend time meditating and listening to myself, the, the more I think that this is the right path. So I, I hope that more and more people start to actually listen to what their belly is telling them. I, like I, I've spent so much time with my belly in the last little while. I don't know about most ladies, but I, uh, I recognize that I have been trying to tune out of that belly for a really long time and learning to breathe into it to walk with it and use it as a tool has been really really interesting and but it's it's almost like i'm having to relearn this part of my body but it's yeah. the, it's the part that i need to listen to the most